Hi, everybody. My name is Alexander Malkat. I have the pleasure of moderating this outstanding panel. Uh, welcome uh, from everywhere in the world that, uh, that you're joining us in. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, we have uh, been asked to think a little bit about the state of logistics and trade and supply chains. And in particular, um, we have this provocative question about um, the state of panic in the environment, given obviously the, the, the COVID crisis and all of the supply chain issues and all of the sensitive trade discussions that are flowing, not only from COVID, but if we're candid, the geopolitical situation that, um, that impacts our situation in the world today. Um, we have with us uh, three outstanding panelists. One of our members seems to have gone missing in action. Hopefully he'll join us in progress. I know I've done that once recently as well, so I empathize that that can happen. Um, so if I could ask uh, our panelists just to briefly introduce yourselves, and then we will cover off four themes, which I'll go into to in a bit more detail. Um, Hugo, can I ask you to just say a few words about yourself, and then we'll go mm -hmm. over and shake. I'm Hugo. I'm living in uh, Switzerland. And I managed over the last 40 years uh, many uh, forwarding companies. Uh, today I'm in my own consulting company. Supply chain execution is our field where we support shippers, large shippers around the world, in executing their supply chain. Wonderful. Thank you, Hugo. Thanks for joining. Uh, Rohan? Hi, I'm uh, Rohan Shetty. I'm based in Kodaikanal, a little hill town in India for a bit, but Dubai most of my life. I've been in deep sea industrialized shipping for over 30 years. Uh, I'm more of a crisis manager, uh, so they only call me when there's trouble. Otherwise, uh, I, well, I, I, I bore them and they bore me, and um, I'm happy to be here to look at solutions. So you're saying your phone has been ringing nonstop for the last two years? But I, I, had a comment, I had a comment on your first point, but uh, we will we'll, we'll take that offline. <laughs> let's, let's do that. Shamika. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Shamika Siriman. I am the director of the Division on Technology and Logistics of UNCTAD, which is the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, which is the UN's basically the focal point on all related things to trade. Thank you for joining, Shamika. And can I just say to, to the folks joining us, a fellow Canadian, so just for the record. Um, um, Raphael, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, just a thank few you. words of introduction, if you would, please. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Rafael Cascales uh, from Spain. I'm the executive president of the Spanish Association of Foreign Trade Professionals and also the CEO of my own company, which is this Casico, uh, basically focusing the uh, international uh, trade and consulting, specialized in Asia and Southeast Asia. Fantastic. Thank you. And just to reciprocate, my name is Alexander Malikat. I'm based in Toronto, and I consult in various aspects of international trade, including trade finance and risk, um, ESG and sustainability and inclusion, as well as doing some work in the advocacy uh, side of the industry. Um, so what we agreed as a group was that we would take on the theme that Harassus has asked us to explore, but do that maybe in a slightly unique way. And what we'll do is we'll talk basically about four themes over the next 45 minutes. First, the question of what's the state of play? I mean, is there really a panic? And if so, who's panicking and who's not? And I think you'll be interested to find that there are some people doing relatively well considering the circumstances. Um, the question about supply chain reconfiguration obviously is one that we're hearing a lot about, the nearshoring, onshoring, and reshoring discussion, whether that makes sense commercially, whether that's a political strategy, you know, how much of that is are we actually seeing versus how much are we talking about. Then there's the question about uh, sustainability in supply chains, which is a huge question. And we know, for example, that global shipping, especially commercial shipping, contributes very significantly to carbon emissions. Um, and I saw a statistic recently that puts the global shipping industry at twice the emissions that Canada produces and almost as much carbon emission as Japan produces. So it's a significant question for the industry and the sector. And then finally, um, we were asked to think a little bit about how to improve the situation and how do we, what, what kind of resolution steps can we be taking if indeed we, we agree that there is a kind of a panic in the situation. So with that context setting, Hugo, if I could ask you to just start us off on the conversation around the question of panic. Who's panicking? Do you see any panic? Um, what's your take on, on the title of our session and, and how we can take that uh, discussion forward, if you please? 
I mean, uh, the, I see definitely panicking uh, importers and exporters. Uh, the industry, the logistics industry, not there too busy counting money. But uh, the panic is before and after logistics uh, because uh, a lot of things have been just in time. Low stocks and uh, the disruption within the shipping industry, which is a long-term problem, just came out of COVID now. Uh, or with the sanitary crisis, it got a little bit uh, more tense. However, this this whole development is from a long uh, time, getting um, governments out of subsidies, uh, and the term ship bonds, which are not available anymore. So the investment into the shipping industry uh, has been decreasing over the last years. And knowing that we come from a long period of overproduction, we are now in an underproduction. Uh, so the panic is uh, for people who relate on uh, a, a steady uh, buyer market, which is gone, which is definitely out, and uh, we are in a supplier market now, and we will have to adjust it. Okay, that's great context. Can I open it up to our colleagues on the panel? Anybody care to jump in and, and support or, or provide a different view? Yeah, Alexander, can I just say a couple of numbers I to, uh, to contextualize the situation? You see, the container shipping freight rates have gone up by 4 to 5%, four, four to five times uh, compared to pre-COVID situation. And this is a big concern. And I think, you know, you, you, and then this is not, uh, this is just the average, yeah? Huh? You look at the China to U.S. West Coast, it is four times the pre-COVID average. And if you look at the spot freight rates to West Africa, which is five times the pre-COVID average, to South Afri America, it is seven times the pre-COVID average. And to South Africa, it is eight times the pre-COVID average. And this is a concern. And it all started in the U.S. and in the West Coast, and it was all a demand-driven Thing because people did not go to restaurants, to gyms, they worked <laughs> from home. So they started to order peloton machines and uh, home projects, uh, you know, all kinds of other exercise machines and stuff. So it was a moving out of services into goods that created this heightened demand. And plus, of course, you know, there's all this congestion, you know, this uh, sanitary requirements, very strict sanitary requirements on ships and ports and other transportation, then created the bottleneck. So this was like the perfect storm. And so there is a panic. So just want to let you know it's a panic, and the panic is much bigger for, you know, for developing regions who did not order Peloton machines. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, that's really striking. And actually in the preparation call, I think um, Hugo and Rafael and I had a chat about the multiples of cost. And I think there, there are some other numbers. Rafael, I think you had some comments when we were discussing how to approach this question. Yeah, well, I would like to add that the panic, uh, I'm, I'm, I totally agree with what Hugo said, uh, but I would add that the panic is also in the government. Uh, right now, we are... Uh, getting ready for a huge wave of uh, increase in the prices. And that is a serious problem for, for any economy in the world, for the macroeconomics in the world. Uh, so we have this uh, inflation coming on uh, due to this supply chain crisis. And why not? Uh, due to China. Uh, China, which is the big elephant in the room. Uh, we, the supply chain is dependent on China uh, quite a lot. So actually, China is due to this situation of pandemic and also the uh, situation of China itself is exporting inflation. So the rest of the world and the governments, I think, are panicking uh, because uh, that changes the 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 scenario in all economies. When the inflation when the inflation comes in, uh, everything changes. So that is a, a serious problem that um, the governments uh, need to address. Uh, of course, it would, all, it would all depend on how long that this, this all takes, right? But uh, yeah, I, I would say that that is a, probably the biggest problem. Yeah, so, so interesting point to bring in the inflation piece, right? Um, 
the other part of that equation, of course, is all the stimulus spending that governments have had to do to support their economies during the crisis. So it's not a one-sided kind of sword, uh, but there are definitely elements in the supply chain that, that contribute to this. Rohan, do you want to jump in on this point? Yeah, I mean, I mean, and you guys have uh, spoken primarily from my point of view on the retail side, like when you talk about China, but don't forget China is also a net importer of a whole range of raw materials that produce these goods that folks, uh, Shamika refers to, sit at home and they click and buy and buy and buy and buy. So, you know, it's uh, the container uh, aspect of it is just one of the many pieces of the, uh, uh, of those dominoes lined up that has that are you know that have uh, you know contributed to this perfect storm as you referred to, and. Uh, it's the, if you take the, my, my main market, which is the bulk market, uh, it went through the roof as well. But interestingly, even though it went to the roof, uh, let's say, uh, uh, last month, as, as it was not as high as 2008. So I feel that there, there is a chance of th- things getting worse. Now, when you talk about panic, um, obviously the political uh, folks and uh, the so-called powers that be, they are in a panic situation because they have to face their, they have to face their public due to inflation and, and supply chain. But my friends in the shipping industry, they're not panicking at all. You know, they are making so much of money. Uh, they don't want to, they don't want to maintain the ships. They don't want to do this. They don't want to know. Let's, let's, let's rake in as much as possible. Uh, you know, uh, so not everybody is panicking. Okay. There are a lot of people who are using this opportunity to change the way they do business, to reinvest and re, uh, redo their fleets. And there's a lot of things. So I, I'm, I'm a, like I said, crisis guy. So I always look at the brighter side of any crisis, right? Don't make, uh, don't waste a good crisis. So I believe a result of this will be a huge amount of correction of various types um, that will ease the panic um, in, let's say, 18 months, not before that. 18 months. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't. I don't think it's going. I, to, agree. I mean, if it happens, great. Yeah, uh, you know. But I think it's going to I take. I agree. Uh, it's a huge. It, it's a big world. How? But have has the population in the world increased? No. Has the number of ships in the world increased? No. So what's the problem? It's within. I think a lot of it is artificial, and things can be. Uh, things can change, but political will. Uh, I'm not a politician, so mm-hmm. you know, I'm not good at reading these guys. And Can I, think I just you're... add one thing here? I think I think we all need to uh, accept and admit that the out of the, uh, to get out of this mess, we need to vaccinate the world. That's the only way out. So we address the pandemic, we address the heightened uh, demand for goods. You know, people will start going back to movies and restaurants and I don't know whatever they used to do pre-pandemic time, and it will also have a huge stimulus impact on the world economy. So vaccination the world is the way out of this mess. I think everybody needs to, you know, start rethinking about that. Yeah, agreed. Hugo, you wanted to jump in as well, I think. And no, I fully support what you say and uh, it's not comprehensible how much uh, uh, opposition we have for this vaccination, especially in countries where people are very well. Uh, so there is quite some homework to do in Western democracies uh, about this. Uh, you know, I just moved to central Switzerland where I'm actually in the canton with the highest incidence. Um, this is in one of the richest countries in the world where people by conviction are not getting vaccinated. So I, I guess a lot of people do not have answers for this. I just asked for my booster and they told me at, when you're 65, you can get it. So you see also the government is not always on top of uh, Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, to show at this point, I mean, the boosters, I mean, for me at least, they, they, they raise a moral question, right? I mean, on the one hand, how do you refuse the booster? There's almost a kind of an obligation to take it. On the other hand, when you realize the, the negligible rates of vaccination in certain parts of the world, how, how do you take the booster and then sleep peacefully? I'm, I'm having a really tough time with this one. Um, and then the debate about, and this we're, we're digressing a bit, so I'll get us back on track in a second. But I, I do agree, Shamika, this is a critical point to resolving the bigger problem, right? It, it, it will have these domino effects if we can get people active again. Um, there's there's now a new variant, that, vi- variant that's been discovered in South Africa, which is apparently quite virulent. So we're, we're not out of this yet. Um, and I was just in Singapore last week, which contrasts 
drastically in terms of the way it deals with the situation against Canada and London. London, when I was there a month ago, there's like no admission of any kind of virus situation. The pubs are spilling out onto the streets. I mean, it's, it's back to normal and then some. Uh, where yeah. Singapore has a mask mandate outdoors in 32 degree heat and humidity, and you're you're you know walking through the the city state and masked up. Um, so no, no judgment. It's just that people are dealing with it different ways um, and having different perspectives on it. Um, on I'm sorry, I trust, can I interrupt I you again, Alexander? Yeah, just sure. to let you know, the seafarers, the situation, uh, the vaccination among the crew is only 41 yeah. percent. Uh, this is the yeah. November numbers. So we are, and this is another yet another big risk that is looming for us. And, and Rohan, you, your article actually spoke, the one that you shared with it actually speaks to that situation. I mean, that's yeah. just as Singapore and Dubai and other jurisdictions yeah. who had issues coming from external workers coming into the jurisdiction, you can imagine yeah. the seafarers arriving and, and carrying the virus with them as well. So. I think that's no, it's it's a it's a it's a sad contradiction, Alexander. Because you know, like I, like I uh, refer to uh, you know folks in my industry who are, are raking uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, yet they treat their crew uh, not so well. So I did speak to somebody this morning about the same thing. He said, "Well, Ron, we would like to help, but we have governmental problems." I mean, you talk about seafarers, uh, Shamika. You look at the airport workers in Shanghai, for example. Uh, I don't know. It was one week work, one week quarantine. And one week quarantine at home. So they basically 66% of the time they hang around doing nothing. So it's not only that, it's inefficiencies created by these quarantine systems. And <laughs> each one is completely different from the other. It's one, so I am not a medical person, but it's one virus and A, B, C, D, but 200 different versions of uh, protection. It doesn't mm -hmm. make, uh, it doesn't make sense, right? So it's pretty obvious there's more to all this than meets the eye. I don't know what it is, but I don't, I, it's, it's odd, you know? Let, let's let's get ourselves back onto the core discussion of the panel. And I yeah. completely appreciate that this has relevance, but I don't want to get us too far down this path. Um, one of the other, let's talk a little bit about the supply chain reconfiguration discussion. So, are, are we? There's been a lot of talk about reshoring and onshoring. From my perspective, a lot of it is political, and a lot has to do with speaking to the domestic audience. And I'll take the U.S. as an example of this. Uh, so let me ask you in your respective roles, how much actual reshoring are you seeing? How many meaningful plans from companies to reconfigure their supply chains do you see? And I'll just prove it. So let, let me ask Raphael for you to start us off on that one. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's all about timing. Um, Rohan was saying 18 months uh, to recover, to, to be recovered from this situation. But actually, if we see that the, the COVID is still there, uh, it will take longer. And this is critical um, for that, for that decision that the companies uh, have to make uh, about reshoring or nearshoring or relocating the, 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 the factories of the, of the places where you, where you produce and import. So uh, in my opinion, from the Sp Spanish perspective, um, you know, South of Europe should be a place where you can relocate from, from Asia. Uh, uh, but we are not seeing much of it. Um, you know, when you when you are uh, taking a decision based on a on a on a cre exceptional situation like is the pandemic, uh, you might be wrong. So uh, th that decision of relocating of reshoring uh, needs to be made uh, not only based on this pandemic situation, but in a, in a deeper situation. Uh, I had a I had a chat like one week ago about this with some Spanish companies. And uh, okay, okay. If we are buying from China, if you are buy, if we are buying from Southeast Asia, are we changing uh, our strategy only because we've been uh, for two years in this kind of supply chain crisis? No, we are not changing our strategy because of that. We are changing the strategy if China really changes or there is some kind of. Uh, structural uh, change in Southeast Asia. That's that's my feeling. Understood. I mean, look, the the I the the, the, uh, the thing that you keep hearing about recently is it's not easy to relocate a billion dollar semiconductor plant from Taiwan to wherever you want to relocate. That is even worse. Yeah. Right. I mean, and the other the other flavor of this, and I know this from another context. I was in some meetings last week where. You know, there are jurisdictions, for example, Panama, who are saying, if you are really considering reshoring and nearshoring, here's an economy that's prepared to welcome you and has the infrastructure and is prepared to accept people coming into to, to certain jurisdictions. So I know there are at least a few jurisdictions in Latin America, in part because of the U.S. 
response. Yeah, response. that is different. That is the U.S. perspective in 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 that Spanish or South 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 Europe perspective. Is the situation if if we are talking about the U.S. is totally different because that is uh, the trade war with China affects a lot. That is a critical uh, a point that affects. Uh, U.S. companies in that decision, and of course, yeah, Panama and Mexico, and and, and probably uh, uh, Central uh, America country will be better off. Probably. Other comments? Yes, I mean, uh, I, I fully agree. Uh, if we look in the eighteen months, probably two years, even longer, it, you you know, the major players in it, and it's a paradox to increase uh, lift would decrease rates. So you're forcing an economy, uh, a logistic economy industry to reduce their rates by increasing the volume, knowing that you talk, especially in chips and planes and heavy investments. So uh, even if you like to invest today five billions, when do you see the results uh, in a couple of years? Because these ships first have to be built and uh, put on the market. On one hand, on the other hand, I think that, uh, and I see that with my plans, that we start to say we have to rethink the way our supply chain works. But the rethinking of how it works is rather a complex issue and not a complicated issue. Because if it would be just a complicated issue, we could give it down and give some instructions on an end. But we are dealing with a complexity where I consult actually my customers to get teams together who can deal with the complexity. Uh, you have first your interests, etc. You have to include your customers' interests. Uh, depends where they're located and on and their needs, etc. And offshoring, onshoring, as, as you said before, this is very complicated. Then you have uh, in companies uh, certain habits. The last decade was definitely managed with Excel sheets. Who is the cheapest on the block around the world? Where is my best optimization? Transport was so cheap that you couldn't care less about it. Yeah. And now uh, we have all these factors. And, uh, we need, and I consult a couple of very large corporations, where we have to find now and build teams who can think out of the box, who can think five, ten years down the road, how do we going to be in the future with supply, demand, uh, our clients, looking at the various ecosystems of a company, uh, talking to the ecosystem, I think that's also very important uh, to see. There are different measures in the future, maybe not in the semiconductor industry, but uh, in other industries, we can have stocks again. We can build stocks again. You know, nobody wanted to have any stocks. Everything is just in time. Um I penalize you as a supplier if you don't have enough on time on my machine, but I hear what stock and I give you back liability. So it's then a question also of the various business models and our pre-session I explained. The whole garment business, uh, the business model is geared in. I take in, uh, if you like, 500 different uh, brands, pieces, and an ant I see in the first months of the winter season how I sell it, and then I fly in whatever I need to fly in in order to avoid any stock and sales afterwards. So I had last week a dinner with the Swiss cargo uh, world uh, manager. He's telling me that actually out of Vietnam, uh, importers in Europe are paying up to 3,000 Swiss francs a cubic meter to get in uh, a Paris. Because their business model is based on uh, low stock, see what is going, oh, the blue ones are working better, so we fly them in. So imagine a cubic meter uh, of a pound that's not so many shirts uh, or blouses or whatever. They pay up to 3,000 bucks a cubic meter <coughs> right now to get this in for Christmas, which let me, is absolutely insane. You know what? It, it is striking, and it's the business of going from 
just in time and global to just in case and local. And you see that in the mm-hmm. space. And now we're going to think about this in the vaccine space, despite the complexity of the components that make up the vaccines, that's going to be a very central discussion. Let me tie in the next point, because I'm just slightly conscious of time. Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about the ESG and sustainability piece. And I'll actually expand that, Shamika, if I may, to bring in the emerging and developing markets, which I'm assuming, you know, UNCTAD would be particularly keen and well-placed to speak to. So if you see things like the dynamics that Hugo is describing on cost and the dynamics we're seeing on on shipping that you also shared some numbers with us on, help us understand a little bit what impacts you're seeing at UNCTAD as you scan the, 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 the implications of all of this. Thank you. Now, these are important points. I think let me uh, emphasize what Hugo and others said earlier on the on the global value chains, and that will relate to this talk that we are going to do on sustainability. We have just come up with a study, uh, a report on review of maritime transport. Uh, I think you can check UNCTAD website, you will see it, and we are looking at this uh, whole supply chain, you know, reconfiguration, what works and what doesn't work and where things are going. And I think I agree with all of you. It's the labor intensive, low value supply chains can be, you know, reconfigured easily than the more complex, high value added manufacturing, the semiconductors and, you know, the automobiles and so forth, these part and components, uh, uh, concentrated uh, uh, areas. Now, then this relate to the whole sustainability story I think sustainability is how a firm firm operates without destroying the future for all. I guess, you know, transitioning to this kind of a new business model is going to be difficult because it's a totally different way of thinking of business. And of course, it's also going to be costly. But what is going right now is that the many companies will, if you don't do that now, you know, plan ahead and do the go towards the sustainability And we believe that the businesses will be dragged towards sustainability, kicking and screaming. And why? Because you saw at COP26, there is an enormous amount of social activism around this. And the world is aware that the climate change is here and it is scary and we need to do something. And the shareholders will speak to this. And this is going to happen. We see this is already happening. And I'm saying kicking and screaming because if you if the businesses do not adjust themselves and plan ahead and you know a, a gradual orderly transition towards sustainability, they will anyway have to com- to comply with very strict regulations coming companies way. Especially we see it in uh, Rafael. You probably see this a lot and lot in Europe on uh, green ga- greenhouse gas emissions. The compliance are quite tough. This then will affect the, all the value chains down the road too. So this will then affect the developing regions where the factories of the world are, are, are you know, producing things. So this is a this is a reality, and the companies needs to plan for this now. And I think the big multinational companies are already taking uh, uh, steps uh, because they have realized uh, sustainability reputation. Is prof- it leads to profitability. They are taking steps to reduce pollution, reduce waste, energy efficiency, water efficiency, sustainable, you know, uh, uh, retailing. Like, for example, Hugo, you would know, like I go to Carrefour here in France to shop and there are no plastic bags now. So mm-hmm. this thing is all paper bags. So sustainable retail, it's already happening at the multinational company level and it is going to see into the factories of the world in Asia and elsewhere. So this is this is a place where we need to start working towards. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a clear evidence of the expectations of consumers shaping the behavior of the multinationals, which then trickles into the supply chain right Sorry. down to the right t- down to the tail end of it. A um, couple of quick points on this. I mean, there are those who will argue that, um, especially in the developing markets, you know, this whole business of stopping to finance coal projects. In some parts of the world, coal is the only viable alternative for heat and energy. So there is this just transition concept of you can't apply as a broad brush to all of the jurisdictions. You have to think 
carefully about what makes sense in certain parts of the world. There are others who will say, look, commercially, I don't really have time for this nonsense. And we had some, some really interesting discussions, even in the preparation calls, to say this is a later on priority. I still have to think about shareholder returns and ROI and all those sorts of things. And yet, to your point, Shamika, the consumer is driving this, but also the other piece is the investor community is driving it. So when you have Larry Fink at BlackRock and other sort of major private equity and asset managers demanding this kind of behavior and actually refusing to vote with their dollars with firms that are not aligning to ESG and sustainability, this is really going to impact supply chains as well. So I'll, I'll bring in Rohan and, 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 and Raphael on this point in particular. Yep, so uh, I think uh, from a sustainability, uh, uh, you know, ESG point of view, changes are happening. I mean, I wouldn't say it's hindering. Yeah, Shamika said th these things don't happen overnight. But like my industry, which is very uh, archaic, you know, there's a lot of resistance to change. Because uh, like I explained, I mean, Hugo, remember when we last spoke a few months ago, it's the life of our, our asset is 25 to 35 years. I mean, you can't just change overnight. What do you want? What do you do? do? Just pull out an engine and put another one? It's not going to happen. But things are happening, you know. Uh, tomorrow I'm interviewing a young kid uh, in, in Buffalo. He's uh, he left school eight years ago, and he's uh, got a, got the startup, got several million dollars uh, worth of funding uh, for autonomous uh, ships, and he's come up with a, a concept, and he's already uh, you know started running. Well, these young kids, they're thinking far far ahead of their of their time, and I know Yara in uh, Norway is, uh, has started actually uh, fully green uh, autonomous. Um, uh, a ship uh, on, a, on a small feeder operation. It is happening. So uh, there, there will always be this large picture thinking organizations or governments or, or bodies which will drive uh, and probably like Shamika says, drag everybody, you know, kicking and screaming. Uh, but when we have the quarterly result, uh, how many ethical investors do we have amongst all these? Let's say we have 100 ethical, 100 investors, maybe 4% or 5% are what we call ethical. Everybody else wants the dollar tomorrow. Every every consumer uh, in the U.S. wants that T-shirt for $1 uh, uh, to be produced at $1. You know, they'll pay 10 times more for it. And so uh, it, it needs to be looked at uh, quite differently. Uh, it, um, it It is there. It is here and present. And it is happening. The question is pace. What do we? What what can we do to increase the pace of this change? Um, in my opinion, like uh, like I said in the in the meeting we had last Monday, uh, I, I do believe it's a later on concern. Uh, you were mentioning cold um, before, and and we've seen it. Uh, China is based on coal in 60%. 60% of the energy in China comes from coal. You cannot, you cannot cut just 5% because if you just have scarcity of coal, we've seen what happened. They, they have energy cuts, power cuts. So uh, and I'm, I'm not talking about the industrial way, but in the houses, you know. So it's, a, it's critical uh, to think that not everybody is in the same level of development and it's not realistic to think that... Uh, China, Southeast countries, India are cutting off that easily, uh, the, 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 these emissions. Having said that, uh, you know, European Union has this plan for 2023, 20, I think, uh, Hugo, uh, this, this fit for 55 thing that uh, will force all the importers to indicate uh, who is the factory where the goods come from, and they will put a tax on it if they don't fulfill the carbon emissions that the EU, European Union has marked. So this kind of a, a, a power force to, 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 yeah, to force the, 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 basically the Asian factories to fulfill the, the European Union uh, carbon emissions. That is coming in 2023 to 2025 in a test mode, I think. Uh, so that is coming. But to be honest, I, I'm not sure that will work, you know, everybody will do, trick it or do whatever it takes to, 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 to say that it, it, it is uh, uh, fulfilling the, 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 the request, but it, it probably won't. What I mean is that, uh, again, the supply chain sustainability as such, uh, for me, is like the latest concern, to be honest. In terms of the uh, in terms of the development of the origin of the countries 
and the and the and the logistics itself. And then one really good, interesting point that Hugo uh, uh, mentioned uh, the other day was the, and, and Rohan just said, you know, technology and the new generation. Technology and the new generation. Uh, I think that they are probably the best drivers to improve that in the short term, uh, mm -hmm. like the the new fuels and the new ideas to improve the logistics and, and probably the way of producing things. Uh, that's my, I think that's uh, what we should focus on in terms of sustainability. Rafael, I, I, I can I just say a few it. things yes, here? Please try. Uh, just to, I think I, I, I agree. I think, you know, technology will be the ultimate savior of all of us before we all disappear from the uh, <laughs> from this planet. I mean, I, I, I have a, uh, I guess that's the only uh, uh, recourse that we have. So let's hope But the green premium for this new technologies are very high. So you are not going to go for those very high premium green technologies when you have, uh, you know, low uh, price technologies readily available. So it will not happen if this high green premium comes unless it comes down. Now, I want to also say that if you live uh, 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 below a dollar a day and if you don't have electricity, And you cannot be told that you're not, your children are not going to have electricity in the night to do homework because you are now need to save the world. I think responsibilities are not equal. Responsibilities as to how much you can pay, how much you can afford, what kind of margin you have to afford to save the world is very different. And, so and, I and, think it's extremely important, these financing elements that the COP26 started to discuss fail to agree. I mean, always fails to agree when starting say, can you put a big fund so that the developing countries can reach out to this fund and begin their sustainability initiative? This is the elephant in the room. This has to be addressed because I think this is our future uh, as a species. Huh? And and the, the hundred billion that was agreed in principle that was never put on the table is actually... It never materialized. No. It's, it's, a, it's disgraceful because the number isn't that big. Exactly. And, um, And so, so, and then the other piece on responsibility, Shamika, and I agree with you 100%, is the history of it, right? It, it wasn't, if, if, you, if you eliminate all of the carbon emissions across Africa, you will put a minor, minor dent in the global emissions. Yeah. And historically, it isn't Africa that was a contributor to, where, to, God, to get us where we got today. So, and similarly, India and China, historically, again, I mean, they may be the big emitters today, but when you look across 200 years, that wasn't where the problem was coming from. So I'm with you on, on, on that issue. Um, I'll just share one data point with you, and then we've got six or seven minutes to talk a little bit about the solutioning piece, which I think is a good way to wrap this up. Um, one of the things that makes it, Rafael, to your point about whether it's a today problem or tomorrow problem, one of the things that struck me is this notion that if the temperature of the earth goes up, what is it, um, three or four degrees from where we are today, the entire world becomes uninsurable. And that yeah. is a striking place to be. I mean, if, if, if the situation is so risky that nobody is prepared to write an insurance policy on anything we do at that point, that's kind of a crisis point. And we really don't want to get there, right? Because I mean- the I think it'll be too late, yeah. Yeah, the implications of that are huge. I mean, then we better all get onto, you know, one of the spaceships from Bezos or, or Branson <laughs> or one of the others and just take off and see where we end up. Um, okay, look, on, on the solutioning piece, Ron, you, you kindly were going to get us started on this, and then I want to come uh, to you, Hugo, because you haven't had some airtime in a while. So, Ron, if you could start us off. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 from a solution point of view, I think uh, our approach, my, my, my personal position is that our approach is wrong in that we are, we are shooting the messenger. You're blaming the logistics guys for this problem. It's not. So that's one thing, So, which is why I never agreed with the concept of the headline. But I, I guess that was provocative uh, to start with. The solution could be, uh, you know, prioritization to supply chains. What's important and what's not? Solutions can be found. But you have to wean people off cheap stuff. That is the number one cause of it, right? Otherwise, uh, you know, the, 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 in absolute terms, the quantum of food or raw materials is still, the moving around the world is still exactly the same. It's not changed. So that has to be done. And that, those are political games, you know, for folks, uh, you know, in economics and, and, or, or, and, and that type of stuff. So if you can separate those two, I believe a, a, a solution can be found. It can. Now, whether it will be found is a separate thing altogether. 
I'll right? tell you what. So for me, uh, in the, the short term would be prioritizing what is important for humanity. And and I'm sure, see, shipping lines, for, them, for me, I don't care what you put in my ship. It's just something I carry from A to B. It doesn't matter. It's the people on the outside. So if we can prioritize that, possibly things will change. Legislation in the bottleneck points. If we can just address those things, things will change. Like I know Florida and Texas have said, you know what, to help with California, come out here, we give you a free run. And that, that will change things and so on and so forth. So I think these are, it is one of the things that we can do um, and, and that, that will give a solution. But there's no quick fix. Understood. And actually, an hour ago when we started this panel or 45 minutes ago, I was thinking it's just after five in the morning and I'm ready to pour a double scotch based on what I'm hearing. So you're, you're, <laughs> you're saving me from day drinking here, Rohan. Thank you for the slightly more optimistic angle. Um, we have about five minutes. So if I could ask you to just do a quick round with one or two thoughts on how we solution or improve the situation. So um, Hugo, if you could start us off and then I'll ask Shamika and then Rafael, you'll close us out if that's okay. Okay, uh, down to the point, what I can see, what we can do this afternoon and tomorrow, understand the ecosystem where you're in. Uh, as a leader, normally it's the larger companies within an ecosystem who are the leaders. Understand what you're doing, connect ecosystems to each other and optimize. And optimization, we would have about 30 to 40 percent of optimization worldwide of uh, uh, shipping capacities, etc. Uh, not in every commodity, etc. But generally, yes, so let's stop to send uh, empty trucks around. Uh, let's stop to have a full container ship. The hiking price is helping to this right now. But uh, there is a lot of optimization we can do. And I think if we get good, agile teams together who can deal with this complexity already to know exactly what we are doing and sharing that with other companies who are doing that too, then we already have a lot of work to do, which is concrete day by day, improving our actual situation. Not Perfect. a final solution, but it helps. Perfect. Thank you, Hugo. Shamika. So as I said earlier, vaccinate the world and it is seafarers. That's the only way out of this. We need to get back to normal life since we will not be ordering all kinds of stuff on e-commerce. We'll just go to see movies <laughs> and go to restaurants, number one. I think number two is we have didn't really get into much, but I think you address this decarbonization of shipping. This is, needs to yeah. be addressed. And I think there's a, there's a proposal at International Maritime Organization to yeah. levy have a levy on international shipping and to yeah. use this levy then to support the small island developing countries, the least developed countries to decarbonize their own you know, activities. And we agree with it. I think these, these steps needs to be taken and they needs to be taken now. And, and thank you. And there's a, there's a technology initiative to try to address the decarbonization thing, which I learned about in Singapore too, but I can't get into it in the last minute and a half. Uh, Raphael, over to you to close this up. Well, uh, this is a conjunctural problem uh, caused by the pandemic. So we had a shock demand, uh, a shock in the offer. Uh, so the vaccines are there. So if we get the pandemic addressed as soon as possible, uh, the, the, the stock in the in the offer uh, won't be there, and, and I think the market uh, it will adjust. Uh, we're getting higher prices. We will get not so much stock demand. So uh, I don't know if it will be eighteen months, twelve months, thirteen months, or whatever. Uh, but I think the market will adjust the crisis in the supply chain that we are living now. If we talk about the deeper crisis in uh, in the in a structural way in the origin in Southeast Asia, China, India. Uh, that is a different story, probably political in the terms of uh, if we want them to be more sustainable, uh, that's uh, arguable, arguable. And uh, uh, in my opinion, in the coming years, uh, probably we need to get uh, rid of the idea that we can buy so many things so cheap as uh, we've been doing the past years. Right. That's a, that's a great way to wrap up. And we are right on. Less the is more. Less is more. Indeed. Less is more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, my friends. Yeah. Wonderful to have this discussion with all of you. Really enjoyed it. And I'm sure that the community will. Thank will you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Frank, All the best. for meeting us, for, for having us join you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Take care. Thank of you. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.